And now here's Connie Mack with a personal message. Baseball has given me many exciting moments since that afternoon when I played my first game back in 1884. But none of them gives me a greater thrill than the privilege of sending this message to you of our armed forces throughout the world. Baseball's place in our American way of life has remained steadfast. And through this picture, we want you to know that the crack of the bat, the slide for the bag, and the roar of the crowd still are a part of our America. So once again, we send you and your gallant allies the highlights of another World Series. We hope it brings you a measure of relaxation and entertainment. Good luck and Godspeed to all of you. And here we are at the 41st World Series first that has ever been an all-St. Louis series. St. Louis is streaming into Sportsman's Park today to see the prodigal Browns and the repeating National League champion Cardinals match wits, bats, and brawn for the championship of the world. And the Browns walk into this series the hard way. They fought the toughest kind of a fight to get here, and they're raring to go. It wasn't until the last day of the season that the Browns won the American League pennant. And here with his son is Chet Labs, who slammed two home runs in the final game of the season to win the pennant. But these Browns are not a one-man team. The records show that they punched out hits when they counted when they won ball games. There are several minutes left before game time, and this is the series. So let's look around and see who's here. Here's Connie Mack with Donald Barnes and his mother. Barnes is principal owner of the Browns. Connie Mack never misses a series. He's a real fan. And here's manager Billy Southworth of the Cardinals and his son, a major, just returned from active flying duty in the European theater. The major's wife and daughter are card rooters too. But down on the field, Mort Cooper, the Cardinals ace, a 22 game winner this season is warming up. Cooper appears to be in great shape for the opener. Mort greets the Browns starter, Denny Galehouse, who carries the Browns pitching hopes today. And over here, Luke Sewell, the manager of the Browns, gets together with Billy Southworth, the Cardinal leader, to pose for cameramen before the series starts. Meanwhile, the groundkeepers are smoothing the infield. While they do that, let's have a look at the opening lineups for the two ball clubs. For the Browns, Gutteridge, second base. Krevich, center field. Labs, left field. Stevens, shortstop. Moore, right field. McQuinn, first base. Chrisman, third base. Hayworth, catching. And Galehouse, pitching. For the Cardinals, Hop, center field. Sanders, first base. Musio, right field. Walker Cooper, catching. Karowski, third base. Litweiler, left field. Marion, shortstop. Bourbon, second base. And Mort Cooper, pitching. Down at home plate, the managers and the umpires thoroughly go over the ground rules. There are temporary box seats on the field and a few other things to thrash out. But now, a final salute before the game to those players of organized baseball now serving their country. To them all, the American League sends a special greeting and best wishes. Now the teams are taking the field, and the umpire yells, Play ball! The 1944 World Series is on. Here's the first pitch. Strike! There was little action in that first game, until the first half of the fourth inning. And then with two out, Moore slashed Cooper's pitch between first and second for the first hit off the Cardinal ace. 
Coming up to bat is George McQuinn. As he steps to the plate, Cooper takes his sign, pitches, and McQuinn connects. And there it goes, a long drive over the right field stands for a home run. Moore is scoring. His manager, Luke Sue of Happy, well, what do you think? And here comes McQuinn. That makes it two to nothing for the Browns. There were no other scores until the cards came to bat in the ninth. And then Marion smashes one of Gale House's pitches to center. Krevich misses a diving catch, and Marion pulls up at second with a double. Bergamo is out, Gutteridge to McQuinn, moving Marion to third. Ken O'Day is sent in to bat for the pitcher and lofts a long fly to center. Marion tags up at third and scores after the catch. The Browns still lead two to one. Johnny Hop ends the card rally by flying out to Krevich in center. And the Browns win the opening game two to one with Denny Gale House, the winning pitcher, and Mort Cooper, who gave up only two hits, the loser. Play ball, play ball. The baseball game is just about to start. Play ball. Manager Luke Sewell has chosen Nelson Potter, winner of 19 games for the season, as his pitcher for the second game. Opposing him will be Max Lanier, the Cardinal left-hander. Lanier is one of manager Southworth's most dependable hurlers. The first outburst in the game came in the Cards' third inning, when Ebel Bourbon opened with a sharp single to left field. Pitcher Lanier punted. Potter fumbles the ball, picks it up, and then throws it away past first base. Lanier is safe, and Bourbon goes all the way to third. It's two errors for Potter on the play. Gus Bergamo is thrown out at first by Gutteridge. Bourbon scores from third, and the Cardinals lead one to nothing. In the Cardinal fourth, Sanders walked with one out. And then Whitey Karoski lines a single to left field. Sanders stopping at second. Slats Marion is the next hitter. Marion hits one to Chrisman. The Brown third baseman fumbles it, and the bases are loaded. Second baseman Bourbon flies deep to Labs in left. And Sanders scores the second card run following the catch. Trailing two to nothing with two out in the seventh, outfielder Gene Moore slapped one over second for the Browns' second hit off Lanier. Catcher Hayworth doubled deep into left field, and Moore galloped across the plate with the first Brown run, leaving the cards in front two to one. Pinch hitter Mancuso singled to center, and Hayworth scored. That tied it all up two and two. In the eighth, Mike Krevich smashed a double off the left field wall with none out, and the cards were in real trouble. Manager Southworth decided to take out Lanier, and Blitz Donnelly took his place on the mound. Chet Labs attempted to bunt Krevich to third, but finally fanned. Donnelly got Stevens on strikes. McQuinn was purposely passed, but Chrisman struck out to end the inning. Neither side scored in the ninth, and going into extra innings, McQuinn let off the Brown 11th with a double off the right field pavilion screen. But when Chrisman bunted down the third baseline, Donnelly made a fine play on the bunt. His snap throw to Karaski at third, retiring McQuinn on one of the closest plays of the series. Let's have another look at that play, and we'll slow up the action.
Sanders opened the Cardinal 11th with a single over second. Karaski sacrificed with a perfect bunt down the third baseline, Sanders going to second. After Marion was purposely passed, pinch hitter Ken O'Day lined a sharp single to right, and Ray Sanders scored with the winning run for the Cardinals. The final score, the Cardinals three, the Browns two. The series was all tied up after the first extra inning World Series ball game since October 8, 1939. For the third game, Jack Kramer was the Browns' pitching selection. Here's the official reach baseball, used in all American League play. And here's the way it looks when Jack Kramer tosses it. That's what the Cardinals face today. Manager Southworth selects the young right-hander Ted Wilkes for pitching duty. In the Cardinal first with one away, Johnny Hopp was safe when Stevens let his grounder go through him for an error. Hopp went all the way to second on the play. After Musial's pop fly to Stevens, Walker Cooper singled over short, scoring Hopp with the first run of the game. But in the Browns' third, with two out, Moore slams the first hit off Wilkes, and then Stevens singled the left field. Moore stopping at second. McQuinn drives a safety over short, and Moore scores to tie up the game. Stevens stops at second. Left fielder Zarilla singles, and Stevens scores with the Browns' second run. Mark Christman smashes another hit over Marion's head. McQuinn scores, and Zarilla advances to third. Crispin taking second on the throw-in. The score is three to one for the Browns. That was enough for Wilkes. And Fred Schmidt, a new right-hander, is sent in as the next Cardinal pitcher. Hayworth is intentionally passed, filling the bases. Schmidt uncorks a wild pitch, and Zerilla scores, putting the Browns in the lead by a score of four to one. The Cardinals scored a run in their half of the seventh, making the score four to two. Don Guthridge opens the Brown seventh with a screaming double off the right field screen. With two out and Guthridge on third, catcher Cooper lets the fourth ball get away as Vern Stevens walks. Guthridge scores on the pitch, making it five to two. And here's George McQuinn, leading hitter of the series at the plate. There's the pitch, it's a long double to right and Stevens scores all the way from first. The inning ended with the Browns leading six to two. Jack Kramer pitched on smoothly and coolly, and the Browns went ahead in the series at two games to one, as Kramer fanned Litwiler for the last out of the ball game. Play ball, play ball. The baseball game is just about as the Browns lead in the series two games to one, manager Sewell repeats warm congratulations to his two winning pitchers, Denny Galehouse and Jack Kramer. Today for game number four, Brown hopes rest on Sig Jakuki, while the Cardinals hope to battle back with their ace left-hander, Harry Brookeen. Jakuki got Litwiler for the first out, and then Hop beat out an infield hit. Stan Musial, slugging card outfielder, is the next hitter. Here's the pitch, and wham! There she goes over the roof of the right field pavilion. It's a home run. Hop scores ahead of Musial, and the Cardinals jump out in front, two to nothing. In the Browns first, after Krivich singled, Hop makes a sensational catch of Gene Moore's long drive to right center field, stopping the Browns' scoring chance in this inning. In the Cardinal third, with two on and two out, Walker Cooper singles to left center, scoring this one. First baseman Sanders is the next batter. Sanders drives a hard hit ball at Guthridge, and it gets away from the Browns' second baseman. Musial scores the second run of the inning, 
which put the Cardinals in front four to nothing. The Cards scored another run in the sixth. In the Browns' eighth, Harry Burkeen walked Gene Moore. Vern Stevens connects with a fast one and drives a long single into right field, sending Moore to third. Chet Labs hits into a lightning double play, Marion to Bourbon to Sanders. But Moore scores, making it cards five, Browns one. In the ninth, with two on and two out, Krevich hits a bounder to second baseman Bourbon, who tosses to Marion for the force out at second to end the ball game. The cards win five to one to even up the series at two games apiece. Harry Burkeen's fine pitching was the highlight of the day. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out to the crowd. For the fifth game, Denny Galehouse and Mort Cooper were selected to continue the pitching duel they began in the opener. Both the Cardinals and Browns know that the winner of this game will take an important edge in the series. Galehouse takes his position on the mound, and the game is on. Danny Litwiler greets Galehouse with a smashing blow off the 400-foot mark in left center field for a two-base hit. Galehouse is in a hole, but he strikes out the side as Hop, Walker Cooper, and then Sanders go down swinging. In the sixth, with no score and two out, card Ray Sanders connects with one of Gale House's slants. It's a long drive and over the wall excursion, far over the pavilion roof. It's a home run, and the cards lead one to nothing. Mort Cooper finally ran into trouble in the same sixth inning. The Browns filled the bases with one out and looked very much in the ball game as Zorilla comes to bat. But Cooper bears down and Zorilla is called out on strikes. Chrisman goes down the same way, leaving the cards ahead one to nothing. Galehouse was still pitching strong for the Browns as the cards came to bat in the eighth. But Danny Lipweiler connects with the first pitch. And the ball sails into the pavilion in right center field for a tremendous home run wallop. The cards lead the Browns two to nothing. The Browns were desperate in the night and sent in three pinch hitters. Cooper gets Burns on a call third strike. Chet Labs also looks at the third strike. And there's two out as Cooper bears down on Chartak. Mike swings and misses for the third out and the third Cardinal victory by a score of two to nothing. Mort Cooper's brilliant shutout pitching gives the Cardinals a three to two edge in the series. And his 12 strikeouts come within one of equaling a World Series record. His 12 strikeouts and Gale House's 10 set a new record of 22 strikeouts for a World Series game. Play ball, play ball. A baseball game is just about to start. Play ball. Nelson Potter is selected to stop the Cardinal drive in the sixth and what proved to be the final game in the series. Billy Southworth counters with his southpaw, Max Lanier, aiming for the Cards' fifth world championship. In the second inning with one out, Labs is the brown hitter. Here comes the pitch, and there it goes. A long triple into center field for the first hit of the ball game. George McQuinn punches a single over second base and Lab scores. The Browns jump out in front by a score of one to nothing. In the Cardinal second, Karofsky single. But Potter picks him off the bag, and the card third sacker is run down. He's out. In the fourth inning, with one out, Sanders on first, Cooper on third, 
Karowski hits a grounder to Stevens, who tosses wide to second. They're safe all around, and Walker Cooper scores the tying run of the game. Marion fouled out, and then Bourbon singles to left field, scoring Sanders to give the Cardinals a one-run lead. Pitcher Lanier follows with a sharp single to center, driving in Karowski with the third run of the inning. The Cards lead three to one. There was no further scoring, and here we are with the Browns batting in the ninth. After McQuinn fouled out, pinch hitter Burns fan. Chartak batted for catcher Hayworth, and Wilkes, who did a fine job as relief pitcher for Lanier, struck him out, ending the sixth and final game of the series by a score of three to one. The jubilant Cardinals mobbed Ted Wilkes. This victory brought them the World Series title, four games to two, in the first All St. Louis series. It's a proud and happy bunch of Cardinals who troop into their clubhouse. It's their fifth world championship, a new National League record. And among the first to offer his congratulations to the new champions is William Herridge, president of the American League. Out of first place in their league only four days during the season, the Cards celebrate their biggest victory, winners of the World Series of 1944. And the thousands who saw the Browns put up their hard, gallant fight move out of the stand, still talking of the stars of the series. Cooper, card pitcher, who lost a two-hitter in the opener by two-to-nothing score, and then came back to win and strike out 12 Browns. Walker Cooper, Mort's brother and battery mate, whose catching was brilliant. Martin Slats Marion, whose shining play at shortstop, was the defensive feature of the series. And George McQuinn, who led all the batters with a 438 average. Denny Galehouse, who won the opening game and then lost his second game in a pitching duel with Cooper. And Jack Kramer, who hurled brilliantly for the Browns' other victory against the potent Cardinals. And so the baseball season has reached its climax, the World Series, with the Cardinals champions of the baseball world. Baseball, the great American game, goes on and on. And we'll be back again next year with all of its thrills and colors. It pays to play. It's the American way.